Good evening, everyone, and welcome along to our Faroe Get Career Coaching Clinic webinar, focusing on careers in business, sales, and finance. This career coaching webinar is an exciting initiative created by Faroe to provide young people with an opportunity to learn about careers and professions that they may be considering. Faroe is a leading youth organization, engaging one in 10 young people across Ireland. Faroe encourages young people to take responsibility for themselves and to be part of shaping the world around them. You can get involved through your local club, or you can avail of one of the many programs Freuge offers, like Leadership, Nifty, and the Be Healthy, Be Happy program. If you would like to find out more, please visit www.freuge.ie. With us tonight are our panelists, Siobhan McCormack, Declan Kenny, and Aideen Bowling. This evening's webinar will be a mixture of speakers and interviews. These career webinars were designed to give young people an insight into professions, and to inform young people's choices. You will still need to consult with your career guidance about specific questions around courses or the CAO system. Throughout the webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. You will notice along the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A feature. We strongly encourage all attendees to use this function and to get involved. At the end of the webinar, we will be running an evaluation poll. It will take less than a minute and we would really appreciate everyone taking the time to complete it. So first up tonight, we will have Siobhan McCormack. Siobhan qualified through the College of Commerce. Siobhan has worked with Feroiga, the National Youth Organization for over 20 years as part of the senior management team and head of finance, where she oversees Feroiga's annual budget of over 20 million euro and works with a wide range of public funders. Siobhan, you're very welcome to the panel tonight. I'd like to invite Bernie McHugh to do the interview with you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks a million, Siobhan. Um, so Siobhan, I suppose maybe just as a start, um, you might just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what your background was, and maybe how you got into the world of business and finance. So I grew up for most of my life in Tala in Dublin. I'm originally from Dublin. The first few years I was in Canada, my parents had gone there uh, for work. I grew up in Tala. I went to Tala Community School. Um, when I left Tala Community School, I went to the College of Commerce in Rathmines. Uh, accountancy wasn't necessarily where I was aiming, but business was, was what I, I thought I wanted to do. So that's where I, that's how it started. I went to, I started a degree in business studies in the College of Commerce in Rathmines. And now I didn't actually complete it. Uh, but I, I worked uh, at the end of first year, I worked with a small business in Dublin and the accountancy firm that was advising them at the time offered me a full-time job and offered to support me in the professional accountancy exams. So I took that option and I went mm -hmm. to work full time and studied at night. So it was Great. a number of years later, then about three or four years later that I qualified. OK, so um, that and in what were you doing exactly in that role, say, in, in, that, in those starting um, days? So with, with the accountancy firm I worked with, it was a small firm. There were, I think, four partners uh, in Fox Rock in Dublin, and it was a great learning experience. Uh, we had clients from a corner shops, farmers, all the way up to publicly quoted companies. So I got great exposure in not only the bookkeeping and accounting side of things, but also you know, witnessing the advice that was being given to, to businesses to make business decisions. And it was during a particularly difficult time in the Irish economy. So there were a lot of challenges there and it was just great experience. Uh, I probably didn't appreciate at the time the breadth of the experience. But then when I moved on later in my career, I realized that those skills were transferable to any sort of business, profit or non-profit, profit, small businesses, large businesses. It, it was a great grounding. Okay. And um, if we just go back maybe to school, would you always have seen yourself someone who was interested in business or maths or was it something that you decided on maybe a little bit later on, maybe when you were deciding what you were going to do after school? Yes, I didn't. I didn't always think that business was going to be for me. Now, I did like maths. 
but you definitely don't have to be a maths whiz to be in business <laughs> at all. Uh, but I suppose that kind of, you know, logic and problem solving was something I liked science and, uh, you know, those kind of subjects. Languages wouldn't have been my thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I changed my mind a number of times, you know, during the course of, of my secondary school career. And even when I went in, when I chose that business studies degree to start, it was because I still hadn't really made up my mind about which whereabouts in business I wanted to go. So, yeah, maths, I didn't do accountancy for Leaving Cert. I did economics. I didn't do business studies for Leaving Cert. And I've spent all of my career doing accountancy and business studies. <laughs> but um, so and I suppose maybe that's great for some of the young people to hear that, you know, because we found like throughout these, um, Siobhan, these events that young people are quite worried that if they don't pick the right subject uh, in fifth year, that it's going to maybe affect them further on but I think we are hearing it from all the mentors it's like don't worry that you know it, it'll fall into place for you and um, yes. like in your case you didn't do accountancy or business but you did yes yes that's yeah. right and and I know that that is a big pressure you know particularly I know even at my um, at my time I had to have a language you know or it was restricting so many options for me even though I it wasn't my strong point at all and I know that that still holds true for a lot of young people but other than that you know and I I think the thing about business is that in and at a third level the beauty about business and business and finance uh, study is that there are a range of options that I think every third level institution offers a range of business courses and then there are also routes in that don't involve a degree there is an accounting technician course where it's it's similar to nearly an apprenticeship where you start you can do a two-year course it's very similar to the way I qualified on the job you're working in a practice in an accountancy practice and you're studying at night and that actually gives you a formal qualification in itself but it's also a starting point to go on to do further study if that's what you choose to do. Actually the first question has come in on the Q&A Siobhan was uh, asking was it difficult to uh, study at night and work did you find that hard? Now, I have to tell you that it was very much all encompassing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a, a memory of something watching one of the programs about, you know, music from a particular year or television programs from a particular year. And it was the year I was doing my finals. I don't think I saw anything that happened outside of that. Mm -hmm. But the, the beauty of the professional exams is that apart from the final exams, you can take them at your own pace. So you have to have completed level one before you progress to level two, but you don't have to do all of level one at the one time. So, you know, it depends on how motivated and what your own circumstances are as well. The logistics of getting to classes and doing um, well, I suppose now everything is online, but hopefully that won't be for forever. And um, so it was it was difficult, um, but it was it was I made some great friends there that are lifelong friends as well because we were all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. But also what we were learning at night, we were putting into practice in the day. Like it wasn't the all theoretical. You know, we could see the benefit of what we were learning. So it was yeah. a challenge at the time, but it, it seemed to go by quickly too. And it was so worth it in the end for me personally. Actually, that's a question. That's another one that's come in there is, um, did you find the course, was it like theory heavy with learning definitions or was it more practice based? There's a mix. There is a mix because mm. you do have to have the theory. You have to have, you know, the the ethics, the company law, the, you know, there are some pieces that you do have to have, but most of it is practical and, it, you know, you are using it on it and I'm still using it. And that is one thing about this career is that you have to keep up to date. You know, everything is, you know, as things progress, you have to, as company law changes, or in my case, because I'm working in a not-for-profit, the regulations around working in the charity sector, you know, the pensions and tax legislation changes all the time so you do you, you have to keep on top of it but sorry to come back to the original question it there was some theory but I found that it was you you could apply it I particularly struggled with company law while I was doing the exams 
And I think it was the same thing. I was better with the numbers piece rather than the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that that knowledge still stands to me. I still refer back to, you know, I, I might have a nugget somewhere there that I remember from those days and it will lead me to go and check something. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there was a lot of practical work in 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 the in the course. Yeah, but in order to qualify as an accountant and to become a member of one of the professional bodies, and there are a number of professional bodies that are recognised internationally, you have to have a number of years of work experience studying under um, a supervising accountant. So the work experience is part of the qualification. You can't just come out having done the exams and say, I'm I'm an accountant, you, you have to have the work experience. As and well. that's actually another question that has just come in there is like, do you feel you learned more by studying and working? Was it maybe easier to, you know, when you maybe when you learned the piece of theory or whatever to put it into practice then? Did you find that easier? Yes, it probably was. But, you know, sometimes I wonder if I rushed out of college you know I like I I missed a piece of something else as well there but like it worked out well for me mm -hmm. um but I suppose as you are when you're young sometimes you feel like it's a race to the finish and it wasn't necessarily you know there's time to mm -hmm. to kind of work through it but yes I think that working while I was studying it de definitely made the the study more um relevant to what I was doing okay so moving on to today, you are the head of finance in a, a, a large nonprofit organization, which is for Oiga, um, with a huge budget. So what exactly do you do? Um, what does your job entail for those? OK, can I, Bernie, if you don't mind, I'm going to fill you in on kind of the gap between there and then. Because okay, if, so there's a gap. Right. If, that's, if that's OK, yeah, because I do yeah, want to let, gap. I wanted to let anyone that's, thinking about accountancy as a profession just to know that I actually had no idea where it was going to lead me when I went down that road um, mm -hmm. so well, after I qualified I stayed with the firm I trained with for a number of years and one of my colleagues that trained beside me is now a partner in that firm and she stayed there um, mm -hmm. but I my husband's also an accountant and we decided we wanted to travel so we ended up working for a large accountancy firm Pricewaterhouse an international firm in the Caribbean for eight years so we did that there um, and before we left, for the last two years before we left, we actually started our own business there and we had a restaurant, a waterfront restaurant there for a few years before we came back. We had our children while we were there and it was time for school and then we came back. And it was just, I just wanted to kind of let people know mm -hmm. that you never know what, you know, where these kind of things can lead you. I, the accountancy qualification for me has always given me a self-confidence that it's internationally recognized and it's need, people need accountants in good times and in bad, you know, mm -hmm. so there's, there is a demand yeah. there, an inherent demand there. But in Feroiga, my daily work now, I'm, I'm, I, and, and it's another beauty of the, of the profession is that you can choose the kind of area that you want to work in, like a, the, the work that Feroiga does is very close to my heart and I love being part of the organization. But my husband's passion is golf and he's managing a golf club and he's also an accountant. So, there's, you know, it can lead to, to different in different directions. In my day to day work here, as you say, we have a, a responsibility to manage a very large budget. Um, most of our money is coming from government, but there we also have fundraising and we have corporate sponsors. Um, you, everyone is aware of the responsibility there to make sure that the money is recorded properly as it comes in and also that it's spent in a responsible way. So it's my responsibility to make sure that there are controls around that money and how it's spent and that it is spent for the purpose that we were given it for. But uh, uh, that's kind of like an overarching piece. But after that, then it is my job to collate the information and to report as necessary. It might be to a funder, it might be to government, it might be to a government department, <coughs> excuse me, it might be to a corporate sponsor. And also I would, uh, along, there's a team of us in, in, the, in the finance department here and everyone plays a critical role in it and we work together then to for example a manager in 
one part of the country might say, right, I'm, I'm going to apply for some money. I want to do this piece of work. And it will be our role then to put together how much is that going to cost if you want to do it for 12 months or two years um, and work together with the manager and with the potential funder to try and make that work. And then down the road, we'll be reporting back on that. We have just over 500 staff in Froiga, so we're responsible for all of the salaries and the reporting that goes with that. Now, of course, a lot of that is automated, um, but it's still there's, there's controls in place there. So I meet with the senior management team very regularly and I would speak with them uh, very frequently and with the board and the chair of Froiga. So we report from the finance team, we report to the board on a monthly basis on all of the expenditure. Um, so we work very closely with the treasurer on the board as well. So my day can change. You know, I know it's hard to say that accountancy is any like it doesn't have a great reputation <laughs> for being exciting, but it, there can be different things happening. Um, it, you know, every day, the speaking to funders, attending webinars about something that's relevant to us, um, updating our own procedures and policies. So it's busy. Well, there's actually a question came in there that accountancy has a stigma for being boring. And do you honestly believe it's a rewarding or interesting job? I think you might have answered that there. But <laughs> okay. you want to expand a little on that, um, Siobhan. Yeah, I do think it's interesting. I, I think that what I'm doing with numbers is telling one part of a story. So the, the all of the work that we do, and, and whether it's in a not-for-profit or it's in a a business the the finances are only part of the story but they're a crucial part mm -hmm. um and i think that the problem solving piece and the ability to look at the numbers and read that story understand what is it telling you there is this is this a good decision is this a bad decision can we mm -hmm. can we do that or should we do this and you know that kind of analyzing our options and helping people to make decisions around that that's that's the interesting piece of course there is the piece that has to be done on a repetitive basis but thank god most of that is you know automated now and um, so it gives you a bit more time to step back and have a look at the bigger picture okay so question here and um, Siobhan is now uh, I don't know the answer to this but what are the benefits of becoming a chartered accountant as opposed to a regular one Okay, so oh, there is. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> okay, so there are there are a number of professional bodies. There is uh, the Association of Chartered Accountants. There is the AC, which is ACA. ACCA is a, a Association of Certified Accountants. There's Cost and Management Accountants, and they're Certified Public Accountants. The ACCA and ACA qualifications are internationally recognised, and they can also perform perform audits so that's where you're going into somebody else's business to check that the records they're keeping are accurate and we in Freud would have the auditors come in every year to check that what we're doing and I have also sat on that side of the desk as well when I worked in Price Waterhouse we were auditing all sorts of businesses in St Lucia um, that's the beauty of that that's the benefit of those two but auditing is a very small part of the the bigger picture of, of accountancy. Um, the cost and management accountants um, are, and I'm not really sure the question about being a regular accountant, you, the professional qualification, it would be one of those four and that would be recognised. The only piece with the chartered and the certified is that you can actually audit as well. Okay, right. Um, just gonna look down through another few of them here. Um, what do you think are the skills an accountant needs? Skills. Okay, so mm -hmm. obviously attention to detail is important. But I actually think that communication skills, because I do believe we're telling a story and to be able to, and, and often we're communicating with people whose first love is not numbers. And we're trying to explain, you know, what, what mm -hmm. these numbers mean. Um, so I think communication is very important and being able to work in a team. While it look, you know, it might appear that an accountant sitting behind a computer all day on their own with the screen, it never works like that. It's you, you're always part of a team, whether it's people reporting up to you or you're reporting up to people 
or working sideways with banks or, uh, you know, whatever other inputs you might have into your financial system. I think communication and teamwork are, are very important. Um, what's your favorite part of it? <laughs> My favorite part of accountancy. Mm. Oh, look, I know I, I, ha I, I'm probably going to sell it short, but you know, I do like the there's black and white with a lot of it, you know, and it, the, these are the facts. This is what it, this is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. I like that. I like the. It, you know that you can you can quantify something and say what it is and from a bigger scale of things i love that the transferability of the skills when mm. i started off like friends would ask me to give them a hand with you know when they got their first job getting their tax sorted out and you know from and now that I'm at the other end of my career now, my friends are asking me about pensions. So <laughs> like it goes, <laughs> I like the real life skills, mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether you're thinking, if you have a good idea and you're thinking about starting up your business, if you have those skills in your head, you know, it's good. Like if you're applying for a loan, if you're, uh, you know, starting your first job, there are so many pieces that are, are real life skills. So that's what I like about it. And challenges? Do you find any aspect of the work challenging? Yes, there's always challenges, I think, in any work. It would be boring maybe if there wasn't, but um, it can be very cyclical. No matter what part of accountancy you're working in, there can be times when there are pressures. Um, and learning from that and just planning properly around that is very important. Um, I think, and, and sometimes, of course, if there's something that's repetitive, that's a challenge. But then you need to look at that and try and figure out how to to, to, to ease that but I think yeah it's just that there are cyclical time pressures mm -hmm. in the work and as I said I think that that happened well it probably happens in every aspect of life you know yeah. but that that I think some sometimes um, accountancy gets a bit of a bad press about long hours when people are training and that kind of thing but there's a definite and that was the case for a very long time um, mm -hmm in the bigger firms. Uh, but I think that there, there is a real move away from that. Okay. So last question, um, Siobhan, and we will come back to Siobhan in the wider uh, panel chat later on. Um, to any young person who's listening here tonight, what advice would you give to them now if they were hoping to pursue a career in accountancy, say in two or three years time when they finish? Okay, I would say, First of all, you know, to think, it, is it for you? Because it is mostly a desk-based job. Uh, it doesn't have to be, and it gives you lots of entrepreneurial skills, um, but it can be. Mm -hmm. So really, is, is that something that you, that you would enjoy? Um, but not to panic either. There are so many routes into it, and there are so many facets of it, like a what I'm doing is very different from someone who may have studied beside me that might be doing tax or forensic accounting, or there are so many routes, but, but really that most of the professional qualifications, I suppose most people are going in with a degree. It doesn't have to be a business degree, um, but there are, you don't have to have a degree to, to get in. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to, you know, have studied accountancy in for leaving cert I think it's to give yourself time research it have a look at the professional bodies websites and the routes that they have to qualification and talk to people talk to people that are working in 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 business and if you, you know anyone that's that's work, like you may not have approached your uncle who's an accountant he might not be the best person at the party but have a chat and see and um you know and probably maybe work experience as well if they could get a little bit of it I know it's hard at the minute with COVID but maybe in a year absolutely or two. absolutely and it doesn't have to be in an accountancy practice you know like people that are doing bookkeeping um like there's there's lots of of even just how, like when I when I went to work that summer after my first year of college it was it was in a, a glass fitters office but I was doing a bit of bookkeeping there and it just gives you the feel for what does that what does that look like even just to work in an office mm -hmm. um, and to be 
you know, just part of a team like that. So, you know, it could be the corner shop that just might be able to give you some office work for a few hours or, you know, just to try that, try out like working in an office, what it feels like. Okay. Listen, Siobhan, thanks a million for that. There are other questions there, guys, and we will come back to those in the larger panel because I think there are more questions for the main group. But for now, I'm going to just hand back over to Jim to introduce our next guest. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Siobhan. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Next up tonight to speak, we have Declan Kenny. Declan is a qualified financial advisor and is currently working as head of conduct at Ulster Bank. Declan has completed a master's in ethics with corporate responsibility. You're very welcome to the panel tonight. How are you? Thanks, Jim. Yeah, good. Glad to be here. Thanks for asking me. I'll give you the floor, Declan. All right. Thanks, Jim. I'm beginning to think I should have done the, the interview option because uh, it was great to see the q and It was really interesting from Siobhan. So, hi, everybody. As Jim said, my name is Declan Kenny. Um, I, I am from a small village in Longford called Arden. Uh, I come from a farming background. Uh, I went to school in Arden, County Longford, and then I went on to uh, St. Mel's College in Longford, an uh, all-boys secondary school. Uh, and I did my Leaving Cert way back in 1988, long before, I'm sure many of you were, long before all of you were on this call were born, I'm sure. So back in 1988 or 87, when I was starting into the Leaving Cert, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I hadn't, I, I, and, I, and I actually didn't give it a lot of thought. And that's probably one thing I would say to my younger self, if I could go back in time now, think about what it is that you really like. What subjects do you really like doing versus what other people are telling you you should do? You know, what, 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 what has that spark for you? What, do, what, what are you passionate about in terms of the subjects available to you to do? <clears throat> I wasn't thinking that way. So I did a mixture of uh, biology, economics, uh, French and uh, geography. For my leaving cert. In fact, I actually dropped the French and did history instead because I didn't. I actually didn't know you needed to have a language to get to university at the time. So what Jim said at the start of this about taking responsibility for yourself, I think that's an important point uh, throughout your your career and your life is to under get in the know, understand what you need to know and what you need to be doing in terms of that. So I did my leaving cert in eighty eight and. Um, I did business studies. I, I, I applied for business studies in Galway, got that. As I said, I hadn't given a lot of talk, but all my friends were going to Galway and I heard Galway was a great place to go. So I went to Galway um, and I, I really enjoyed uh, my time in Galway. But I joined Ulster Bank in, in 1990. And the reason I joined it, because the, a fella I was sharing digs with in, uh, in, in Galway, his father worked in the Ulster Bank. And I just asked him, could you get, get me an application for him? So he did. And, uh, I applied for the job in December 1989 and started in February 1990. So I'm over 30 years with Ulster Bank at the moment. But it just shows you how things can happen just um, uh, randomly, so to speak. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just give you a flavour of what my career took me through in Ulster Bank. Um, and then happy to be interrupted or take questions at the end. Whatever works for, for you guys. Jim can uh, interrupt me at any time if there's any questions. So joined in Ballina in County Mayo in 1990, joined Ulster Bank uh, after a four-week training program. Um, and I did various roles, probably ones you'd be familiar with. You know when you see the, the cashier behind the counter in the bank um, and that type of uh, role, did that for a number of years. Okay, And then uh, I moved, transferred to different branches. I was in Ballina and then I was moved from our, there to RD in County Loud. Uh, and then I moved to Roscommon, myself and another chap, I opened a new branch in Roscommon in about 1996 or seven. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, one of the, mo the most enjoyable aspects of those is meeting people, uh, you know, getting out there, the, the sense of achievement you get in, do in doing new pieces of business uh, and, and helping customers. And that, probably that brought, brought me on to my, one of my favorite roles in my career uh, in Ulster Bank was that of financial planning manager. What that was, um, uh, was a role where I was given our customers advice with regard to, you know, how to save, saving money, investing money, life assurance, what happens if I get sick, you know, putting uh, solutions in place for that type of thing. And I'll tell you a quick anecdote, it was on one particular occasion, and it was really a light bulb moment in my career, on one particular occasion, um, a, a, a chap came in to me to get advice about setting up a retirement plan, a pension, because um, 
he had been advised by his accountant that it was a good tax option, and it was, uh, to, to save himself uh, from paying tax, put money into your pension fund, and you pay less tax. Uh, it is a good idea. But when I sat down and got information of him, he, he was married, he had two children, his wife at the time wasn't working, and he had no life cover or anything in place, which basically meant if he died, his wife had, had no source of income. So <clears throat> I advised him to take out life cover and put less into the pension, which he did, right? But the reason I'm telling you this story is because about a year later, that man passed away in his, in his early 40s. He got cancer and he died. And um, about a month after he died, I went out to his widow's house with a check for a hundred thousand pounds at the time, and uh, it, it was the life a payout on the life policy that he had taken out with me the year earlier, uh, and I delivered the check to her, and she said to me because he was in the he was in the building trade, and she had a lot of people calling at the house that he owed money to her, you know, looking for her to solve problems that they had in terms of uh, suppliers and things like that, you know, uh, in terms of, of helping them. When I arrived at the check, she said, you're the only person, and I still remember to this day, even though it was well over 20 years ago, um, she said to me, you're the only person that's come here that's helping me. Everyone else is looking for me to help them. And it really was, as I say, a light bulb moment in my career in that after people's physical and mental health, their financial health is the next most important thing on the list. And certainly in that role, I really felt I was helping people with their finances and being uh, uh, being prepared for the future for in financial terms in that role. So I was in that role for a few years. I really enjoyed that. Then I moved on to um, an area manager role where I was managing uh, the, the people that were doing the advising with the customers. Um, and I, I didn't really like that role. And another point I would make to you is in your careers as you move forward, don't always think you need to move up the next step, up the line to, in terms of career progression. Lots of times there's opportunities to vary your career by moving sideways or different ways. And that's what I did. I didn't really like that job, that role. I liked selling myself. I like meeting customers of myself. It didn't really appeal to me to be uh, working with sales targets and things like that on, on other people. So I decided that I wanted to make a move. An opportunity came up and I uh, went into a training. So I was training the staff who were meeting the customers how to do it well. So I really liked that role because it was helping them be better and therefore giving better advice to customers. But I didn't like the I didn't like the sales target hanging over my head. So it, it, it ticked that box for me. So I think the point I was making there to you guys is that you can move around in your career. It's not always the next step up that you need to take. Have a look around at other opportunities, particularly if you if you work in, in a large company, um, you know, um, I moved into other roles then over the over the coming years. <clears throat> and what I would say is people say a job in the bank. There, there was lots of different opportunities. I worked in, in the anti-money laundering and financial crime sections. I worked in uh, operations. I worked in various different roles uh, across Ulster Bank. So it was like one career in Ulster Bank, but a lot of different skill sets and a lot of different roles that I took on over time. Um, and my my... Uh, latest role, I guess, is uh, as Jim introduced me there, is head of conduct. And essentially, the way I see the future of banking going is that there'll be less and less emphasis on, you know, daily banking transactions and over-the-counter services because people will be able to do that themselves on their phone, on their PC. You know, I'm sure you, you know, many of you on this call have a banking app. You know, you wouldn't think of going into the, you can tap your phone and pay for things. You're not going to the bank to get cash or even to an ATM to get cash now. The future of banking for me is, is, is the areas of the right culture, the right conduct, the right advice, that, that financial advice is provided to people in the right way um, and that it's done um, uh, ethically and it's done at the right time and not done for sales reasons or for, for profit reasons, which and banking has got a bad rep in this country and absolutely deservedly so because uh, bad decisions were made about how to sell products. You probably Some of you might have heard about the tracker mortgage scandal, things like that. So the future of banking, I think, in terms of the way technology is developing is people's day-to-day -day banking will be done by themselves. You'll be able to do whatever you want to do yourself. For example, I bought uh, 20 euros just to see could I do it 20 euros of Bitcoin on the Revolut app today you can do that now you know so all of that type of execution stuff is going to be done by people themselves where careers 
will develop in finance in banking is around the advice and helping people with their finances because computers can't provide advice they can they, 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 they can't do that whereas people will do that and overseeing that in terms of uh, risk management oversight of the um, sellers and the advisors to make sure they're doing it right there's definitely careers in that area so providing good advice and also ensuring and overseeing that good advice is provided there's definitely uh, careers in my mind in that in banking in the, in the future um, in terms of other things i would say uh, along the way i think it's important to pick up the relevant qualifications they're they're not not an end in themselves getting qualifications but it gives you credibility when you're in an interview or when you're um you know, uh, applying for a job. If you have the qualifications, that's really helpful uh, in terms of um, uh, moving your career forward. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, so what I, probably what I would say is I've enjoyed, really enjoyed my career in banking. And as I, but it was when Jim asked me to do this, it prompted me to start thinking, if I could look, when I look back, what, when was I at my best and what, how could you package that up in terms of trying to give you pointers that I think would be useful to you? So I tried to break it down into, into three things um, and I'll share them with you. Uh, so what has helped me be successful kind of the following things. Number one, your, your brand. Okay, your brand. Mind your brand. Now, everybody has a brand, whether they believe it or not, you have a brand. And your brand can be, well, that person is really reliable. You can trust them to do anything. They're always on time. I really can rely on that person or the opposite. But either way, that's your brand. So think about what, what do you want your brand to be? And then act that way. <coughs> and um, then that will be your brand. The second point I would make is around networking. Okay. And <coughs> my daughter says a, a good few years ago, she said, the trick is getting noticed, but in a good way. And what I mean by that, I guess, is put yourself out there, volunteer for things that you may not think there's a short-term gain on them, but in your community or at work, volunteer for things that get you noticed in a good way. It's things you like to do, obviously, things that you will enjoy, but put yourself out there, separate yourself from the crowd a little bit. And the third thing I would say is know the difference between skills and behaviors. OK, and as Siobhan re referenced it there as well, I think earlier, <clears throat> skills are things you can learn in, in terms of qualifications, how to do the job and um, behaviours. That's more about you as a person. So what are your behaviours like? What are your standards like? Those behaviours are transferable anywhere. You know, you can bring. Are you a good team player? Are you good with people? Um, are, like it can be simple things. Are you always on time for meetings? Are you coachable? You know, they're your behaviour traits. Your skills then are your qualifications, and they are important as well, but don't remember to separate the two, okay? So um, <clears throat> that's my uh, tuppence worth. I hope you found that uh, useful. Happy to take any questions. Declan, thank you very much for that. And I think you've been very, very kind by, say, by, by saying that Jim asked you to uh, come on this, um, to do this last night. I think it's more like, Jim told you you were coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we really, really appreciate it. And I know that's the other panelists will probably recognise yeah. that as well from whoever asked them. Uh, Declan, I'm going to bring you all the way back to 1984 when you went into St. Mel's. What kind of student were you up to 1988 when you were leaving? What kind of person <coughs> were you? Um, I, I honest, told no, you, yeah, yeah. The statute of limitations has expired, so I can tell the truth now, yeah. Um, I, was, uh, I enjoyed Mel's. Uh, I was more interested in football, Bruce Springsteen and the Water Boys than I was in studying. Um, but I was uh, probably, I, I got, I, I did okay. I, I was, I, you know, I found learning relatively easy. There was some stuff I just couldn't get. I didn't do honours maths. I just could never, I, try, I think I went to one honours maths class and I said, this isn't for me. Couldn't figure it out at all. Um, but uh, I enjoyed it. And I really liked it. Uh, I, you know, I found school was good crack. I, I wouldn't have been the centre of attention or, or, or that, and I wasn't a great footballer either, but I loved being involved and um, I loved the, the crack with the lads and I've made friends and there's lots of us that are, and you know them too, somewhere around the town, Jim, that we're still friendly with, you know, that I met in Mel's. So I enjoyed it, good crack, wouldn't have been an A student all the time, but I did okay in the Leaving Cert. I think in today's, I don't know how it translated into today's money, 
Um, but it, it felt like a 475 type of 500 point leaving cert, maybe 450 to 500, something like that. I imagine I got. Which was not very good. So you went to, you went to college in Galway. What did you study in Galway again there, Declan? Sorry, I might have Business that. studies. Uh, so I went to the RTC in Galway as it was called at the time, it's GMI TM, mm-hmm. uh, and did a year and a half there, but left because I got the job in the bank. Yeah, so that was what I was going to ask. So you actually left, you didn't complete that course? No, not then, but I did go back and do it later. I did. I, did, I, I, I kept the credits I had, and they worked towards my QFA, so I was able to utilise oh, it. It wasn't, it wasn't wasted time, you know? I was able to use, mm-hmm. them later, use the, the, the ones I passed later on. Yeah. Okay. One of the questions here then, uh, what advice would you have then? So you went into the bank, so you kind of uh, co-tailed it, I suppose, on a friend, friend's dad that you met in college. What advice would you give young people that want to apply for a position in the bank now? Position in the bank, right. What The advice I would think I would give you is the, the, the traditional roles in banking are disappearing. You know, the, the cashier, the accounts clerk and stuff like that. And you'll, you'll have probably heard things in the media about you know, KBC is we leaving Ireland. Ulster Bank is, is winding down, and the customers are going to. You know, we're in discussions of PTSB and things like that. So the, the traditional roles are not there. So if you th- if you're thinking I'd like to be a cashier in the bank, don't because that that's not that's not going to exist at all hardly in another five, 10, 15 years time. Right. What I would say is upskill yourself on digital banking, on um, blockchain technology. Things like you know the, the 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 digital aspect of financial services and banking is, is upskill yourself on that, right? Uh, I would say you you uh, should in terms of qualifications, things. Uh, I I always go back to do something you're interested in. Though I did economics for the Leeds and I loved it, right? Um, so uh, because it, it wasn't, uh, it it was more te- sh- shaping a macro story. It was very interesting. So do something you're interested in. And if you're interested in financial services, obviously do something that's related to financial services. So economics, accounting, uh, business studies, through commerce. Like there's loads and loads. Your careers teachers will t- tell you the courses to do. And um, to me, I, I would also say the Irish market's very small in financial services, right? So if, I, if you want to get involved in financial services, think about other countries, either in Europe or the States. You know the opportunities are 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 great. You know, um, and also think about if you want want to work in, in, in banking, it doesn't have to be in it. There's loads and loads of, of bodies out there. You know, everybody knows AIB, Bank of Ireland, etc. Right, but there are loads of other financial institutions out there in Ireland and abroad at the moment. Like Wells Fargo is operating in Ireland. Um, you know, there's lots of lots of other banks that are here, or or other smaller just community finance firms, things like that. That's in financial credit unions. I think the credit union movement is going to grow a lot in Ireland, and, they, and they're really going to become more digital. I think there'll be opportunities there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you got into the bank. Was there much upskilling available to you when you got into the bank, Declan? Loads, and I think that and whatever employer you choose, I would. That's one of the things I would urge you to check out before you join them. Do they have um, upskilling programs for you? So I I got a mixture, like I got a master's in ethics. The bank paid for me to do that and it cost 14,000 euros. So that's just one example. And that's the latest one. But when I joined the bank, there was lots of courses to go on. There was lots of upskilling, you know, about re- customer relations management and um, influencing uh, loads of different courses. There's a library of them. So I, I would urge people to avail of that because it's, 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 uh, it can take up time. Like I, I remember doing a course, I was commuting in and out to Dublin, but I used to use the time of the train to study. So I had to be on the train anyway. So rather than listening to the radio or whatever, looking out the window, not only every day, but most days I studied and got it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how I got my Q of A, you know? So Declan, when you, you went in, obviously from college after doing business, and all that, when were you first introduced to the financial advisor part of the bank? And why, what attracted you to it? And um, what happened was I was in uh, Roscommon branch and uh, we had the financial advisor used to come to Roscommon branch uh, and I liked uh, the look of his job. Right. Um, because par- par- I was like I was in my mid 20s at the time when I met him, met him first. I thought this, this is cool. He had a laptop. Wow. And a, mobile, <laughs> and a mobile phone and a company car. And I thought that's great. You know, but they're all, all kind of superficial things. And I, well, they're, they're nice to have, you know, a company car and things like that. Uh, but when I got into the role, you really felt coming home on a Friday. 
uh, that you had made a difference in people's lives, you know, uh, right. by helping them. So that's what I really liked about it. So the Q <clears throat> on the academic side to do that job, you need a minimum of a QFA to be able to do it. Now you can't do it without a QFA, uh, and you you want to you want to be good with me. You, you you need to like meeting people on an everyday basis and, and be easy with people. And if you if you if you have that type of thing, you're 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 on the right track. I'm going to ask you what would be a QQI now, but um, what would be the best course for somebody if they wanted to go into financial advisor? What would what would you advise them to go into? What kind of course? Which cor the course? Which course? Yeah. Q of, QFA is the QFA is the is the, is the foundation course. Yeah. Oh, is it? That's, is it? That's, okay. the main, that's the main one to do. There's there's after that you can do things like certified banker and and lots of other things, but that that that's the, that's going to become. Uh, like having your driving test you won't be able to work in financial services without it so that's the starting point and it's six exams it's not that hard yeah okay very good thank you so Beth, what is the most challenging part of your role um the most challenging part of my role at the moment can be like my job is to make sure we do things right for customers okay so i go to meetings and i and i deliberately sit there as if i'm a customer uh, and I'm saying to people, I don't like what you're doing, or I don't like this, or so. The, the most challenging piece can be the tension between budgets and uh, challenging people to do the right thing when the money isn't there to do it. Mm. You know, so you can you can end up having uh, professional disagreements with people and whatever you know. So that can be challenging. And um, the most challenging, if I can share an anecdote, and it's if you if you have a minute, the most challenging time I ever had in the bank was when I was put in charge of. of what was called a disciplinary process where basically somebody somewhere a group of people had done something wrong okay um, and to, uh, to, to try and cut a long story short somebody else at, at one of the executives in the organization basically told me i want you to sack them okay but my job was meant to be independent i was supposed to investigate all the facts and when i did investigate all the facts they deserved to be reprimanded but not sacked Okay. Mm -hmm. But the, the executive who's long gone out of Wall Street uh, was putting pressure on me to sack them because that would look better externally to the regulators and other people. So that was the most challenging moment in my career. But I didn't, I did, I stuck by my guns and I didn't uh, sack anybody and it was the right thing to do. And I was so glad afterwards I did. And you will come across things like that in your career where people will push you into a corner and try to make you do something that you know is not right. Mm -hmm. never do something that's going to become between you and your sleep uh, uh, because if it is you're doing the wrong thing so have act with integrity at all times because in the long run you'll, you'll win that way and um, just to follow on there because Siobhan mentioned this as well <laughs> ethics so you went down the role of ethics within the banking um, why did you go down that road um, because after the financial crisis in, in 08 and, and the subsequent tracker scandal like what, what we were looking at there was, it, Jim, you're old enough as well as myself to remember in banking, you, you became a, uh, working in a bank or becoming a guard or something that was a very, you know, there were very trusted positions in the community. Banking turned into something that you, you know, you, you, you know, uh, was, let's say, just not trusted, right? Why? Because they behaved on, in, in unethical fashion across the banking industry worldwide, right? So to me, it was like the bank I joined 30 years ago wasn't the same bank. And how do we get back to that, right? So I wanted to get into something like that gave me the qualifications that I could go and speak with confidence and authority. A lot of times, what stuff I would actually think is common sense, right? But be able to speak with authority to those points to the relevant people and, and forums across uh, the bank, you know? So to me, it's like, it's part of the pathway back to making banking a trusted, credible um, part of our society again. You know, does that make sense, Jim? It absolutely makes sense. And knowing you as I do, it makes perfect sense. Declan, we're going to leave it there for now. We're going to come back to more questions when the main panel comes back. But for now, thank you very much, Declan. Sure. Okay. Finally, we would like to welcome Aideen Bowling. Aideen qualified through the Marketing Institute of Ireland. Having felt hindered at school because of her dyslexia, Aideen didn't let that stop her and has forged a highly successful career a strategic account director with Salesforce, something we're very, very familiar with in Freudia. Aideen, how are you? You're very welcome tonight. I'm good, how are you? Good, I'm going to invite Erica Reed to interview you. Hi Aideen, thanks very much for being part of tonight's panel. 
Um, can you just introduce yourself to the young people, please, and just tell them wh where you're from and what you were like in school and secondary? Um, so I'm from Cork and I would not have described myself as a good student when I was younger. In fact, I, I think academically I've always been hindered because of my dyslexia. Um, but I grew up with a very strong, strong Irish mammy um, who did not let me use that as an excuse and just said, work harder. It was her only way of thinking was failure was not an option. So from a very young age, even though I wasn't overachieving in school, I was thought about a strong work ethic and how that could help drive you forward as well. Did you know what kind of career you wanted when you were in fifth or sixth year or were you choosing your leading search subjects? I thought I did and I went into it. Um, so I absolutely, I loved, I've always kind of loved creative thinking, out of the box thinking, designing programs around marketing and engagement. Um, and I studied marketing and went to the Marketing Institute um, and I did that for four years. And I then moved over to London for the one of the big bright lights. Um, and I spent seven years in marketing and I absolutely hated it. I absolutely hated it for like a number of reasons that people will sell you a career in marketing saying you will get to work on all these different projects and it's gonna be absolutely fantastic. But the realism of it is, is that you will probably work on 10 projects, three will get approved, one will see the light of day, and just before it does see the light of day, your budget will be cut in half. And that was the cycle that used to continuously happen. And I slowly discovered through working um, kind of through the years and saying, why am I not enjoying this, questioning myself? Why am I not, you know, being successful because I'm not passionate about it? And it was because I realized I love dealing with people. And I was missing that sitting behind a desk working on marketing campaigns that weren't seeing the light of day. And most importantly, dealing with a load of salespeople that all thought they were marketeers. So anyone thinking of a career in marketing, went with your eyes open. <laughs> so for people who are thinking of a career in marketing, Aideen, can you just give um, maybe the young people examples of some of the modules you would have studied in college, just so if they're considering it now, what are some of the subjects and topics you would have studied? So there are some subjects that you um, are pretty obvious. You will look at marketing strategy, you will look at business strategy. Um, there's other subjects that you might not think of, like logistics is another one that st um, stands out. Uh, it always stands out because I remember our entire year being quite bad at logistics and our lecture coming in with the to St. Jude before our finals, putting on everyone's desks. Um, so it, it's very business orientated. In actual fact, I will say the Marketing Institute was very practical um, in terms of the subjects that they broached on their criteria. And did you do work experience as part of your college or did you, was it just studying? It was just study. It was so, just study. There wasn't a, an opportunity to do any work experience. So when you finished college, you went to London. So there's a lot of young people um, on here tonight that might be, be considering studying in, in England or moving to England. So it's quite a brave decision to make. So what was that like going over um, to London like when you finished college? It was absolutely scary. It was completely terrifying. I didn't have any friends over here. I didn't have a network to get a job. Um, I, I, I just was going completely alone. Um, I did have the benefit that I was moving over where my, my sister was already here for a number of years, but that was a comfort in the evening if you want to go to the pub for a drink. There was nothing during the day when you were looking for a job or trying to get onto your feet. So it was scary and it did take time. Um, the thing about when I moved to London, I told a number of friends who had moved over here who didn't believe it until they came was for every job at home where you would have one position advertised and a hundred applicants, you're going to have at least 300 applicants over here because everyone comes to, there's a lot of people who come to London. It's a busy hub. 
there's a lot of competition. So you do need to be prepared to put into the hard work and the graft. So when you left, you said you worked uh, in marketing for seven years and then you decided to make a move. So, um, you know, for a lot of people they, in their career choices, you know, their career path can meander a lot. So what yeah. made you, I know you weren't happy, but what gave you, I suppose, the bravery to move and where did you move to? Um, so it took me three years to move. Um, it did not happen overnight. So first of all, I had to convince people that I could do sales and that I could do right strategy. Um, coming from marketing, they just didn't believe it because I didn't have the proven track record. And in every role I went for, they'd say, show us your experience in sales, show us your experience in strategy. And I just got every door slammed in my face. Um, and it, it was really confidence denting at the time. It really did kind of knock me back a little bit. So you had to persevere and just make sure that you kept your head held high and that you're like, no, this is my goal. I'm absolutely determined to get there. So that was it in terms of, you know, it taking three years. And also I changed specialism. Yeah. Tripping over my words there. Change specialism should be easier to say. Um, <laughs> But I moved from finance to retail. And it was retail technology is something I've always been quite passionate about. So I knew and understood it was somewhere where I could excel, but I just needed other people to see that along with me. So that's why it took three years until somebody just gave me a chance. Um, and then I worked myself so far then. And it took my career to go from there. And I would say, you know, it was mentioned about being passionate about your subjects or being passionate about your career. It wasn't until I found something I was passionate about, I started actually seeing some success in return. So can you tell the young people a little bit about your role now, Aideen, and what kind of responsibilities and duties and even like what your daily routine is like? Um, so I don't have a daily routine. I would love one because it would make my life a lot more predictable. Um, so essentially my role is I will go into a client and they will generally present me with one problem. And so essentially it's a way of starting the conversation that it might be that they're not working at their best operational capacity or they're not communicating with their customers in the right way, or they're simply not growing their revenue, um, as fast as they want. So it's my role to go in and do an assessment on the business to present a strategy that I think would be good for them and then bring the technical specialists in to help them move forward. Um, and in terms of, you know, what your day is like, you spend all of your day on the phone speaking to people um, and then all of your evenings working on actually actioning all the stuff that you've talked about all day in terms of writing the papers, making sure that people are very clear in their briefs. So in terms of a skill set, you need to be a very, very clear communicator. Um, you need to be a very analytical thinker because you need to be able to look at a problem from every single angle. Um, and you need to be able to work as a team and have a lot of EQ. So the people who excel in my type of role are people that are quite empathetic to both their colleagues and their clients in terms of understanding their problems and how people work best together as a team. So um, I know you've listed some of the um, skills there and even mentioned having empathy so that you can put yourself in the place of your clients. But are there qualities that you think this question here from Orla Dwyer that you know, make you very good at your job other than being empathetic? Being analytical. Analytical, okay. And practical, actually. A lot of people will go in and they will make a mountain out of a molehill in some of the problems that clients will present. But it's about essentially going back like you would in your leading certain. What was the exam question? And what was I actually trying to ask and help them with? You've mentioned their determination previously in, you know, in changing the special, specialist area that you were working in. That is harder to say than you think. Yeah, it so, is, isn't it? <laughs> So is determination something that helps you in your, and you mentioned as well, the work ethic that you got from your mother. So are those two qualities things that you think are essential to your role? Absolutely. 
if you don't have them um, and you're not prepared to take a few knocks, then, you know, the world of technology is quite hard, especially in sales, because I mentioned about getting projects knocked back when you're in marketing and sales, it's a lot more in terms of a ratio. So you have to be determined to get to the end goal. So people will tell you no all the time and you have to keep on pushing till you turn all of those no's to yeses. Um, you know, often a lot of the questions that come from the young people is about overcoming challenges and you're alluding to it here about how difficult it was to get a job and, you know, how difficult it is to get that sale from um, customers because they probably go to various organizations, not just one, to see where the best offer is coming from. So what advice would you give to young people when they meet challenges like that? Just be true to yourself. If you really, really want it, don't let anybody else tell you that you can't have it. You know, if I look at my company now and getting into it, I'm, I have this argument with the hiring committees all the time where they want a really strong degree and they want to see that they've come from one of the big four technology companies. And I just look at them and I'm like, I have none of those things. Mm -hmm. And I don't care about anyone who does. I want to see tenacity and I want to see determination. And they're the only two qualifications I care about from any incoming candidates. So you work for Salesforce, which is a massive organization. So how do you make yourself stand out in a big um, corporation like that? Um, I stand out naturally by my gender. It's a very male dominated area um, that I'm in. So there aren't many women in my position. So that's one factor where you always stand out. Um, the other is just to make sure that you're being engaging and authentic um, and making sure that, you know, you, you're always being honest about who you are and what you're representing. Now, that sounds like a wishy-washy statement, but in actual fact, it's probably the most difficult thing to do in my profession because most people will just want to please everyone and will come across as a little bit fake. Um, and again, those who are being a little bit more authentic tend to stand out from the crowd, not being afraid to say no. What are, would you say are the two most challenging things about your role? So is it the people that you deal with? Is it the workload? Um, both. So the workload could be hard. So we, I can work till, if I'm in a end of a project, I'm going to be working till 2, 3 a.m. And that can happen consistently over two weeks. But then it's very understood in our business why you might go through a really busy period that'd be very good at giving you a week off. Um, it doesn't help that when you, or it doesn't hurt that when you close a sale, you tend to get rewarded very well. I've had some very unique experiences in my role where um, I've hosted dinners where I've been there with Metallica um, and a few guest customers. So you can get all these little perks um, that you know will come at the end of a sale to keep you quite determined. Um, so is those perks, is that your favorite thing about the job or is it something else? Um, I mean, the perks don't hurt, right? <laughs> It's always going to be good if you can turn around, especially um, as it was a massive Metallica fan. So it's probably why that one is sticking out in memory. Um, but it's actually, it is what I really, really enjoy about my work is coming up with a solution and seeing the transformation that it can make in a business. Now that sounds boring, but I can walk into some supermarkets and know that I've changed their websites and know that it has increased their revenue by a hell of a lot of money um, and that their changes in the marketing communications have come through us through a different program. And it's quite interesting when you're talking to people and they're like, oh, I shopped here and actually they do this. And I sit there going, oh, I wrote that. I wrote that, that strategy, I wrote that customer engagement program. And it's really satisfying to see the impact you can have. So um, you mentioned there that you can sometimes work um, a lot of hours if you have a deadline or if you have a big project on. A lot of the questions we get asked is about work-life balance and, you know, how you achieve that work-life balance 
within your profession. So would you have any advice for the young people on that? Yes, I would say research the company. That if you are ever going to go into a company, make sure that you have spoken to people on that team. Um, make sure you ask them about what their work-life balance is. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you understand what your manager will expect of you if you're going in, because it can change from team to team within the same company. And also, you have to hold yourself accountable. That's something that, that I am still learning to do. Um, I won't say I'm always great at it or I always master it, but it is about calling time, especially the temptation of working from home is letting that those hours trickle away at the desk and, you know, holding yourself accountable to say, right, at six o'clock, I need to leave. You know, get up, go for a walk, cook dinner and just take a break. Um, it's something that you would deal with in your professional life and that a lot of young people will deal with now for going into college is they'll be facing deadlines all the time, whether it's an assignment for college or whether it's a work project. What advice would you give to young people about meeting deadlines and the pressure that that can often bring? So the pressure comes from when you leave it too late. So it, the amount of pressure that's there is really up to you. If you leave it to the last minute, you won't do your best work. You won't feel like you are going to achieve very much with it. And that panic will send you probably into the wrong thought process when you're preparing the paper. So give yourself time. Make sure that you, if you're writing a paper, that you, you know, you almost have three times to do three or four drafts so that you're just writing it and perfecting it all the way along. And it's really going to help you refine your thought process and make sure that you were really happy with what you've done in submitting it. So um, if a young person is or has aspirations to work in sales, there can be a multitude of roles that that person can be employed in. So can you give the um, young people maybe an idea of people you work with and other positions within the company that are in the sales department? Yeah. So within my team on any account, um, I will have no less than 16 salespeople underneath me and they will be of all different types and walks of life so you, you can have a very junior salesperson who's just starting out and they you know are doing all of their cold calling you can have a salesperson who is you know learning their craft in terms of writing the papers and just starting out with the strategy and then you can have the people that fall into different specialisms so it's basically saying whatever flavor or subject that you like, you will be able to find a job in it. You don't always have to look for the director roles. There can be specialism roles that could be within service, marketing, commerce, whatever you find interesting, then there is a role there, believe me. Um, a, a couple of the other mentors on these webinars had alluded to um, the fact that then when they got their first jobs or the first roles that they just watched everybody and absorbed and learned as much as they could would you advise the young people to do that irrespective of whether it's a part-time job or their first job absolutely um it's funny because when I went into Salesforce it was the first time I ever really got proper mentors and I always kind of thought when I got my first mentor, oh, this person is going to give me everything. And you quickly learn that they might have aspects that you want to learn from them. But I've found now that I've got five different mentors because they all give me different things and feed my energy in different ways. Um, so I'd say to anyone who's looking, go far and wide, you know, speak to people. If you see they're doing something that you're interested in, just pull up, buy them a coffee. Ask them why they find it interesting. Ask them why you find it challenging. And also ask them what mistakes they made that they wouldn't make again that you can learn from them. Just to finish up, Aideen, before we join the other panellists and um, take further questions, can you tell the young people what your best career decision was and what your worst career decision was to date? Best career decision was to join Salesforce. Okay. Um, it is a fantastic company to work for. Um, 
you do get a lot of further education, despite the fact that I said it was not academic. I get 5,000 a year to spend on courses I want. Um, so they're very invested in your development and continually improving your skill set. And the worst career decision I made was going into finance, if I'm honest. Um, and that was because it just wasn't for me. And I knew it wasn't for me, but because there's a certain prestige to it, I went into it. So I would always say to everyone, just follow your passion, follow your heart. Don't care what anyone else is looking at. If, you're, if you don't care about your subject matter, it's going to be very hard to wake up every morning and go to work with it. Okay, thanks a million, Aideen. We're going to ask the other panellists to join us now and we there's still some questions that we'll get to, but for now, thanks a million. So to the panel, um, I, a couple of you alluded to, um, you know, getting involved and like Siobhan, you were talking about, you know, working in any industry because you can learn there's accountancy in every business and Declan, you were saying about, you know, getting involved in lots of activities and all of that. So like the young people, a lot of the young people on the are on the webinar tonight might be in fourth year or fifth year. So they're not at the college stage yet, but there's still lots of things they can do as a teenager where they can learn those skills. So Siobhan, what would you say to the young people? Um, well, I suppose I don't want to be just, uh, you know, flying the Freuge flag, but the, uh, but any so, sort of entrepreneurship, like we, I know the Freuge Nifty program, where you're learning some basic business skills and it encompasses marketing and finance and, it, you know, something that just gives you a flavour or some part-time work or even volunteering, volunteer, you know, helping out the treasurer in your local club. Uh, be it a Freude club or your GAA club or your athletics club, whatever you're involved in, you know, just to to work alongside someone, to volunteer just at a, at a very low level, just to get a feel for that. And that will stand to you, as Declan said earlier, that getting involved in the community and uh, volunteering in a relevant area will stand to you. Yeah, so Declan, do you want to comment on that? Because I suppose for a lot of us, we don't recognize how much learning is in a lot of the stuff that we do until later on. It's a hindsight learning almost. Mm. So what would you say to the young people now about getting involved, as you said before? Um, find, find something that you can get involved in. Put yourself out there and get noticed. And I, like just as Siobhan was talking there, I was thinking uh, there's a gang of people in the parish I live in now. You probably have not So it's all around the country. There's the local authority about litter picking. Get, just, I, I know that sounds terribly simple, but it speaks to people's attitude about their giving of themselves. They're enthusiastic to get involved and do things. Now, picking litter is probably one of the most straightforward things you can do, but it says something about your participation, team playerness, if that's a phrase, uh, get, putting yourself out there. So there, there's always something, get involved. So don't say, I don't know where people are living around the country, or city, or, urban, rural, whatever, but there's always something to get involved in. And as Siobhan said, that could be the local guard club, soccer club, whatever it is, or the tidy towns, whatever. There's always something. Just put yourself out there. But obviously then when you go to college, Erica, if, if, when you go through the process of thinking, what do I want to do, right, and then you land yourself in college, get involved in the societies and things that relate to the area that you're interested in. Like, my, for example, my daughter is interested in journalism, right? She's, she's in Trinity. She got herself... Uh, she got got to know the editor of the Trinity News, right? Um, and she phoned her and she said, I'm interested. And now she's writing articles for the Trinity News. So it's like, don't get stuck. Just do something and get involved. You know what I mean? But do it for something that you want, that you, you have a passion for. As Aideen said, you won't get out of bed every morning for something that bores you. Yeah. Nadine, would you give the same advice? So if there are the young people who are, say, interested in marketing, for example, like every business markets themselves, every organization markets themselves. So like they don't have to have a job in a marketing department to help a service or an organization with marketing. So they don't? No, not at all. I, you know, as I said, it, it's almost finding the area you're interested in and then you can find what favor of marketing or sales that you, you want to do or accountancy, whatever it is. But as long as you're interested in the company and subject matter, then that's all that really is fundamental to success for me. 
So there's a question here. I'm actually going to put this to, because you've such different roles, I've put it to all of you. But are all career prospects in the finance or business sector um, encompassing more and more technology? And what does this mean for the future of the sector? That's a very big question. <laughs> but um, Declan, can I start with you? Because you were talking about that earlier on, about how the yeah. roles within the bank have, are disappearing. My own thoughts on that are kind of in two strands. So yes is the answer. Finance, finance, technology, every aspect of our life is becoming more and more technological uh, and digital. That, that, that's for sure, right? And banking is no different. Um, like five years ago, uh, there was very few banking apps at all. People were still going getting cash as an ATM uh, and do, uh, to, to pay for goods and services. That's all changing. So think, like look at reeling in the years, right? We all think not an awful lot has changed, but like when you look at reeling in the years, which seems like no one had to go to me 10 years ago, the world was totally different. You know, you're seeing things like mobile phones are bigger and all that type of stuff. So we are going to get more digital, definitely. So qualifications, working in that space is definitely a career path. But the other path, the other in parallel with that, there are some things that remain constant, right? Around ethics, culture, conduct. How are we treating customers, right? This the, the, and the behaviors and the outcomes that they get, that's still as relevant uh, in the technological world as it was in a more manual world. Okay, to make sure customers are getting the right outcome, you just need to, need to approach it from a different standpoint in how you're overseeing what is being done and what like and our thinking is advancing in around the whole technological world. I heard an anecdote the other day, like as a race, we need to evolve better. Like for example, why are the you know there's Siri and what's the other one called? Um, Alexa. Hmm? Alexa. Alexa. Why are they female names? You know, because straight white men are the people that are designing them. You know, so there's a cultural thing there about within the algorithms that are used in technology. Are we uh, driving outputs that are uh, dominated by people that have a certain view of the world? And what we need to do is have, uh, and there will be careers to oversee and counteract that. I know it's, it's a bit long-winded, Erica, but no, no, so no. There's more, there is more technological development, but that's going to bring lots of opportunities in the new world, but also within existing disciplines as well being updated. You know, we had a panellist on the other night and they were saying that <laughs> there are going to be jobs available for the young people that don't even exist now. Yeah. So, you know, to remain as open to the possibilities, I suppose, as, uh, as, as they can be. So, Siobhan, yeah. um, Frog is definitely an organisation who's, you know, from when I started, has jumped le leaps with technology. And like, I'm sure it's the same for the accounting um, department. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, it, you know, the, the, the pandemic, of course, just had to move us on a little bit faster as well, you know, um, where, where the amount of paper that we used to generate and uh, that's, that's no longer uh, uh, happening now. But I, I want to, to come back to what Declan was saying and about like that move to um, technology and you would have seen Erica even with the way we process things internally that we've moved from paper to online but I think that what that does is that it does create that space where as you mentioned there will be roles that we can't even imagine now mm -hmm. for young people but the soft skills that we've all mentioned about you know being open and working in teams and listening and uh, you know communicating there's still human attributes, I think. I think that we're still going to need those skills. Um, I think that technology, I think the young people on this call probably have an awful lot more technological skills than I do. Um, that, but that's just going to be a baseline that people will have to know um, how to, to operate in that space. But I, I would hope that, that that's not going to be a challenge for most young people. I could be wrong. Um, but... I think that it, it might create more space for people to, to think and to have bigger picture vision rather than things like data entry and things that, that took about, like the, the cashiers in the bank, that that job is, it just won't exist soon. But I, I would hope that it would give people more time to just have, a, you know, time to sit back and look at bigger picture decision making. What about you, Aideen? How much has the industry and technology so changed within yours? 
Oh, massively. Um, so if I even look at our own company, we do eight different releases and updates on our products every year. So when I joined five years ago, it was a completely different company. And I can't even keep up with the pace of the products and how they're changing and how digital transformation is moving forward. So you were talking about, you mentioned there about algorithms um, and how they're featured with Alexa, you know, and who they're designed by. But ask Alexa who you are when you come off this call. Just ask Alexa, who am I? And Alexa will not know who you are. So the next stage of digital transformation is to get extremely personal with all the codes that we're reading from and for them to know who you are and, and to know what your likes are and your dislikes and coming up with recommendations. And that will be the jobs that haven't been created yet. So just, um, and we've asked this question to a lot of our panels. So a lot of the panelists talk about soft skills. So it's not just about your the subjects that the young people choose, but it's about the soft skills. Like you, you've talked about like communication and all of that. So just go to each one of the panelists and just if you can just pick your top soft skill that you think the young people should practice. Because a lot of those skills are learned through practice and are not, you know, people aren't born with it. People learn how to communicate effectively and they learn how to work on a team effectively. So, Aideen, what would you say your top soft skill for the young people to practice would be? God, you reminded me of a conversation I had with my mother where I asked her what my skills were. Um, and to this day, she still tells me she'll let me know when she finds out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I know it sounds really boring. I've probably mentioned it a bit too much, but determination. Okay. Look, we're not all going to be the top performers. If you, you look at a skill, you think that's what I excel at. Joe, you know, it's sometimes just knowing and having that drive to succeed. That can be enough to help you in any career that you're going to go for. Just believe in yourself and just keep on pushing forward. I don't know if that's quite the answer no, you're looking for. No, it is, it is because it's definitely a valuable one. And what about you, Siobhan? What one would you pick? I think it's a, it's around communication, but even a, a little bit more than that, it's about, I know that my, I, I, my sons are finished college now and they've both come to me at separate times and said that they were so glad they got the skill of public speaking. It's just that, and, it, and it's not necessarily standing up in front of an auditorium, but to have confidence in an interview or to have that, you know, to have that skill set just to be able to engage people, whether it's just across the desk or at the bus stop, or, you know, it's, it, it's just to, ha to be able to portray that confidence when you're speaking to someone. I probably don't have it myself, but I think that that's important. Yeah, it is. And uh, lastly, Declan, what would you say is your top soft skill? Yeah, I, I'd probably contradict Siobhan if I'd say she does have that skill. <laughs> um, for me, I, I was just jotting down a few different thoughts and, and there's, there's lots of different ones. And I mentioned uh, three earlier on, but I suppose I would I would be between, between be an authentic team player, I suppose, is the one I would say. And it kind of relates to what Siobhan is. It's participate with those around you, you know, engage, but do it authentically. Don't try and be somebody else. Be, be your best self the best version of yourself, not the, somebody else, but the best version of yourself as an authentic team player. And if you do that, things will start to happen. Like my brother-in-law is saying, uh, whatever you put into something, that's what you get back out of it. And if you make an effort with people, good things will start coming back to you. So just before we go back to Jim, um, to finish up, just describe your role in one word. So we'll go to each of the panelists and just take a one word description of, uh, of your role and then we'll go back to Jim. So. Um, Aideen, you're up first. Dynamic. No Dynamic. Days the same. Yeah, no day is the same, no client is the same, no team is the same. It's really interesting. Siobhan? Yeah, it's close as well. I was going to say satis satisfactory doesn't sound like good, but it's just <laughs> the satisfaction of a job well done and um, contributing to a bigger picture. Good. And lastly, Declan. Yeah, I was going to say satisfying uh, because what I do is is helping make sure customers get the right outcomes and get treated well. So it's a fe accomplishment, I suppose, a feeling of accomplishment when it's done well, my job, because it's making sure people get treated well. 
Okay, well, to our panelists, thanks a million for answering all the questions and thanks for being part of us tonight. And we'll just have to back over to Jim now to uh, finish up. Thanks, Erica. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. Okay, attendees, your final job of the night is a poll which has been launched right now. Just three short questions, so please take the time to complete it. On behalf of Faroiga, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We hope it was beneficial and that you have gained some insight into a career in business, sales and finance. For those of you who would like to be involved in Faroiga or that would like to learn more about our programmes and how they can benefit you, you will receive an email with all the information you need in the coming days. I want to sincerely thank our panellists who have so generously given their time and shared such valuable advice. Without your incredible panellists, none of these career webinars will be possible. Freud is hosting more career webinars throughout the month of May, and you are very welcome to attend as many as you wish. You can do so by registering through Eventbrite. Thanks again to the panellists and everyone that attended tonight, and good night. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone.